The term minoritarianism refers to a structure of leadership or rule in which a minority of the group holds outsized power over the majority. So you could technically slide various sorts of authoritarian governing models into this concept, but more typically, it's used to refer to an ostensibly balanced democratic system of governance that, by design or accident, allows a relative minority of the people within that system to hold outsized power. Within the United States, historically, for instance, there were policies that gave landowners outsized power and rules baked into law that gave white people outsized power over that of black people and other people of color or recent immigrants who were considered to be less than according to the dominant norms of the day. Italians, Irish, Asians of various origins, all sorts of people have fallen into this category over the past few hundred years, and all have, via various legal or norms-based mechanisms, either been excluded from or nudged out of positions of power as a consequence. In some cases, and this has been true globally and across history, there are groups of people delineated by belief, ethnic background, or economic class who hold more power within a governing system, not because they themselves sit in positions of power within that system, but because they control resources, money, or other sorts of influence that shape the thinking and behavior of the folks who do, the people in government. At times, this influence is overt, and everyone knows about it. In other cases, it's more subtle, a tacit understanding, or perhaps even a completely covert effort by one group to lord over everyone else via a conspiracy or background set of tit-for-tat relationships. Whatever the case, this is generally not considered to be ideal, at least through the lens of modern democratic values, because it implies the wants and needs and priorities of a relatively small group are allowed to supersede those of everyone else, a relatively larger majority. It's been posited over the past few decades, and even more so recently, for reasons I'll get into shortly, that the Republican Party in the United States has become something of a minoritarian governing force. Many recent polls show that a smaller number of people vote Republican than Democrat, and though self-declared independents remain the largest voting bloc in the United States, younger people in particular are gravitating toward left-leaning parties, while right-leaning parties trend older. That demographic shift doesn't look great for the future of the Republican Party. If you project forward and think about how things might look in a decade or so, if current trends continue, but the folks in the Republican Party today being older and on average wealthier than their left-leaning fellow citizens also hold outsized sway in some ways, in terms of ability to spend on political contributions and in terms of being more likely to belong to associations like homeowners groups that hold outsized power when it comes to political outcomes. And they're also more likely to run businesses, which likewise tend to wield influence within the American political system because of their ability to nudge public sentiment and provide a large amount of financial resources to candidates and parties. Thus, the thinking goes, the Republican Party is doing what they can right now while in a position of close to balanced voting parity with the Democrats, but relatively more monetary and other sorts of influence. They're doing what they can to lock in that power, leading into a period in which they will have less and less power in the conventional democratic sense. They've thus been working hard to claim political positions around the country, including big-wig spots like Supreme Court seats, which they gained a supermajority of via asymmetrical, some would say manipulative tactics in the Senate over the past decade or so. But we're also talking about positions that are typically ignored as being boring or unimportant. They've invested heavily in efforts to redraw voting maps, which in many cases gerrymander, that is, bunch up some areas and cut across others so that the representative outcome of these areas favor their party. They've invested in gerrymandering maps across the nation to make it more likely that they will win small and large-scale elections, even if the majority of people in those areas vote for Democrats. And although Democrats have been attempting to do the same more recently, 
the Republicans have generally been more successful at this type of gerrymandering effort, so far at least. And they've continued to benefit from the minority rule favoring Senate, which, in contrast to the other half of Congress, the House of Representatives, awards Senate seats based on state rather than population. So states that tend to be more rural and less populous, like Wyoming and Montana, have the same number of representatives as states with 80 times the number of people, as is the case with California compared to Wyoming, the former containing almost 40 million people, the latter just under 600,000. Wyoming and California have the same number of senators, two apiece, and thus the Senate is more likely to favor politicians from lower population states, which based on local political leanings means it tends to favor more conservative politicians. The outcome of this apportioning setup is that if you control the Senate, you kind of have the whammy on the other wings of government. So even if, as is the case currently, the other party controls the presidency and the House, you can figure out ways to stifle their efforts by either not voting to confirm anything they do, or in some cases, figuring out ways to hobble and delay their efforts, even if they might eventually be able to make those things happen. That representative lean in the U.S. toward rural areas, by the way, also enabled the Republican supermajority in the Supreme Court, as most of the justices on the Supreme Court were installed by Republican presidents who won their presidential elections but did not win the majority of the vote. They won because of how representatives are distributed, despite winning the minority of the total presidential votes. This general topic has been of particular interest to folks on the left in the United States of late, even though it's a decade-spanning trend, because of a recent leak on the topic of abortion rights in the U.S. And I'll start out this episode by talking about that leak and what it might mean. But what I'd really like to talk about today is something related to that leak and the political furor on both sides that greeted it. Medication-induced abortions. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also become a member at understandery.com. But you can find a complete list of both monetary and non-monetary ways to support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. May 2nd, 2022, a Supreme Court draft opinion, which basically means a not yet fully baked, but possibly close to final opinion written by a Supreme Court justice, with all their justifications and arguments for making a ruling, was leaked to Politico, which then published that leaked draft opinion. This set off a firestorm of protests and celebrations because this leaked draft opinion was related to two decisions, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, that essentially legalized abortion procedures at the federal level in the United States. Roe, in particular, has been challenged and reinforced over the years, despite many legal scholars, some of whom are ardent supporters of legalized abortion, saying the ruling itself was a bit flimsy. The argument wasn't very sound in that case. But many of these same scholars then contend that the ruling has been so consistently upheld by earlier Supreme Court decisions because legalized abortion is so popular and should thus arguably be maintained, even if this specific case probably wasn't the best way to make that happen. Now that said, this leaked document showed that Justice Alito, generally considered to be the most conservative and vocally anti-abortion justice currently on the Supreme Court, 
is ready to knock down both Roe and Casey decisions, which would in turn remove that federal scale protection for abortion in the United States, which would then in turn leave the decision as to whether abortion should be legal to state governments. In the United States, the vast majority of people, somewhere between the high 50% to the low 90%, depending on how you ask the question and what specific language you attach to the law, say abortion should be legal. And only about 19%, again depending on how you ask the question, say that abortion should be illegal, no matter the circumstances. Most people favor regulations as to when and how abortions are being conducted, but the outright banning of abortion and the knocking down of the Roe v. Wade decision is immensely unpopular in the United States. It's not even close. Despite that small-d democratic reality, there are enough laws on the books and so-called trigger laws in place in conservative-led states that if and when Roe in particular is struck down, removing that federal-scale protection, that countrywide protection, these states will flip immediately or within the next week or the following 30 days so that abortion is illegalized in various fashions in some cases made a minor crime, in some cases punishing only the doctor, not the patient, in some cases going completely fire and brimstone, making everyone involved a serious criminal guilty of homicide and allowing no exceptions in cases of rape, incest, or the like. This, I want to make clear, is a hot-button issue. And that's true in some other parts of the world as well, but it's especially true here in the United States, where the issue of abortion has been turned into a nearly black and white political tool, a question that delineates whether you're Republican or Democrat, the former almost always considering themselves pro-life, which is their preferred term, or supporters of forced birth, which is what their opposition sometimes calls them, while Democrats tend to be pro-choice, which is their preferred term, or pro-abortion, as Republicans sometimes call them. Democrats usually contend that they want abortion to be safe, legal, and rare, implying that better health care, the availability of birth control, and other such preemptive measures are preferable. But when necessary, abortion services should be easy to get and safe for the patient, while Republicans usually contend that abortions are really just the medical killing of a baby, and thus everyone involved is engaging in a morally and preferably legally criminal act. This topic has been covered ad infinitum in many ways and very thoroughly over the years. And over the past few weeks since that leak, even more so, and in a very of-the-moment modern context. So I'm not going to revisit that political division or the history of it any further in this episode, and I'm not going to get too deep into the specifics of abortions in general. So that's a topic you should absolutely check out if you want to have a fully informed opinion on the topic. What I would like to talk about is a topic that is increasingly in the limelight, but not as completely as abortion more holistically, yet at least. And that's the topic of medical abortions, which are distinct from surgical abortions, in that rather than going to the clinic and receiving a surgical procedure that results in an abortion, Patients who opt for the medical option generally receive some pills, and in taking those pills, an abortion is induced for them, often at home. To be clear, medical abortion pills are different from emergency contraceptive pills, often called Plan B. And if you didn't realize that this was a thing, medical abortions, you are not alone. Some studies have shown only 44% of women between the ages of 18 and 49 realize that Plan B pills are still contraception and thus cannot end a pregnancy in its early stages. It prevents a pregnancy from happening after unprotected sex, but does not end a pregnancy that has already begun. Only 17% of women 50 and older realize the same. And while more than that, 73% and 46% younger and older women respectively, understand that Plan B is different from medical abortion pills. Far fewer understand what the distinction is between these pills. So that's in the U.S., and similar studies have been conducted globally and have found that on average, in areas where women have more autonomy 
like the ability to work and care for themselves, access to good education, things like that. More women are aware of their health-related options, including birth control and abortion-related options. Though even in such situations, the numbers tend to be low, less than half of respondents in general being fully aware and well-informed of their options about all these things. And those numbers become even fuzzier when it comes to the legality of local options and how they might access them on a practical level. There's a lot of mis- and disinformation on such topics, especially in regions that are more religious, in the sense of religion being blended with governance, and in regions where men tend to be considered the household and economic authority. On a practical level, a surgical abortion tends to involve either vacuum aspiration or dilation and curatage, which means, respectively, either pulling the embryo out of the patient's cervix using some kind of vacuum source, or dilating the patient's cervix and then cutting away a portion of the lining of their uterus to remove the embryo. And that latter option is typically only used when vacuum aspiration isn't an option for whatever reason, as it has a slightly elevated risk of complications, whereas the vacuum approach has very little chance of anything going seriously wrong. Medical abortion, in contrast, can be done at home, and almost always is if undertaken during the first trimester. It's also common in the second trimester, though when conducted at that point in the pregnancy, it's generally recommended the second drug is taken under some kind of clinical supervision. This process involves the prescription and self-administration of a pair of drugs, usually a combination of mufepristone and misoprostol, though others are available and misoprostol is sometimes prescribed solo. The success rate of the typical administration of mufepristone followed a day or two by misoprostol is around 96.6%, and this is the recommended approach prescribed by the World Health Organization. If taken later in the pregnancy, another dose of misoprostol is generally recommended after the first one to increase the chance of success. And the reason these two drugs, or similar pairs of drugs, are used is that the first ends the pregnancy by inhibiting pregnancy hormone signals, which causes the uterine lining to degrade, like during a period, and the second causes the patient's body to clear the uterus. So using them both together results in what is essentially an induced miscarriage, rather than something more artificial-seeming, which is part of why some women prefer this option. Medical abortion still works well into the third trimester, though these tend to be rare compared to first and second trimester abortions, and in some cases are illegal, even in places where abortion is legal and commonly available, though there are often exceptions in the case of rape, incest, or danger to the patient's life. That said, in those cases, and in regions where third trimester abortions are legal, the same general principles apply, but the dosages might be a little bit higher to increase the chance of a successful procedure. In many countries, medical abortion drugs are available like any other drug. You generally need a prescription from your doctor, but otherwise the process of getting them is as simple as bringing that prescription to the pharmacy, having it filled, and then taking the drugs at home, as prescribed. Some countries, like China, India, Greece, and tens of other countries around the world, don't even require a prescription. These pills are available over the counter, much like Plan B pills are available over the counter across much of the world. This method of inducing abortions has proven popular in part because of the benefits offered over surgical abortions for many people, and the aforementioned sense that it's ending the pregnancy in a more natural way but also because it can be done remotely. And this is a trend that has been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's been growing since the early 2010s when healthcare providers, from large entities to independent activists, began to make these pills available by mail, providing consultation and support via telehealth services, allowing patients to basically Zoom with their doctors or clinic technicians, which in turn gives them support and information about their options, alongside, if appropriate, prescriptions that can be sent to their local pharmacy, where they can then pick up their pills. In some cases, the pills are sent by mail instead, which can be more private, but can also bypass issues they might face at local pharmacies that don't want to distribute these pills, doctors that won't give them the proper prescription for ideological reasons, or in some cases, local laws 
that illegalize this and other types of abortion. This approach to folks who believe abortions are morally wrong and legally not okay as well is not popular, and in fact, many anti-abortion, primarily but not exclusively more conservative politicians in the U.S., have been trying to make the act of shipping such drugs from places where they are legal to places where they are potentially not in a post-Roe world a crime. Like all abortion procedures, medical abortions are not without some risk though the legal risks might be more pressing than the medical ones for most people if the current legal challenges to these pills do in fact make it into law, because they are generally, for most people at least, super low risk compared to other options. Heavy bleeding, some flu-like symptoms, fever, not fun stuff, and potentially alarming, but compared to surgical procedures of any kind, the risks involved are still quite tame. Some data show that they're actually safer than many painkillers you can easily get over-the-counter across the U.S. Now that said, part of the ideological strategy to push against this approach is focused on the very small number of women who do experience more serious side effects and to present those risks as common, which in turn allows them to present these pills as a hazard that should not be self-administered. To paint them as health issues, basically, that normal non-doctors cannot be trusted with, which in turn is meant to shift public support away from them and toward banning them, both when acquired locally and when mailed from elsewhere. Despite this new round of legal and ideological moves against medical abortions, though, one report found that 54% of all non-self-induced abortions in the U.S. in 2020 were induced by these pills. And that's up from 43% in 2014 and 32% in 2008. So this method, in the regulation-heavy but still legal at the moment U.S., has become steadily more popular each year, starting back in 2000, when the FDA first approved those two major drugs for some abortions. And there's a chance that number could balloon still further in the wake of the pandemic and all the telemedicine practices that we've grown accustomed to over the past few years. Other countries, especially those with well-regarded healthcare systems like Finland, Sweden, Norway, Scotland, and Switzerland, show a potential path for this type of abortion method. About 72% of all abortions are conducted by pill in Switzerland, and it's all the way up to 96% in Finland. There's also a chance, and this is another part of why this topic is so important to discuss at this moment, in addition to it having been a sort of under-the-radar growing trend for many of us for decades, is that even if Roe and other abortion legalizing cases are struck down in the U.S., making abortion illegal in some states, and even if Republican lawmakers are able to go through with their, at times, outright stated, at times coyly denied, ambition to illegalize abortion at the federal level, rather than leaving it up to the states, as would be the case more immediately, there's a good chance these pills will continue to be shipped from elsewhere into areas where abortion is illegal, making the option practically still available in the same sense that a lot of people are able to smoke marijuana, even in places where it is technically illegal, without too much trouble or concern about serious punishment for it. And, like marijuana, the results will vary on that, but it is still a very common thing, despite the laws on the books. These pills, as they are administered by mail today, though, currently take two or three weeks to arrive from their origin, usually overseas, and the companies and nonprofits offering them, like Aid Access, Hey Jane, Carafem, Abortion on Demand, and Plan C, often operate with condensed prescription periods, recommending their patients begin the process within one to ten weeks of becoming pregnant, which can be a big ask when it's sometimes not obvious to many people that they're pregnant for weeks after it happens. Many of these organizations are also at a disadvantage online because of local laws and because of search engine algorithms that sometimes put anti-abortion organizations and resources first at the top of the page, even when the user is clearly searching for abortion pills or typing in something like abortion by mail. 
There are a lot of reasons for this favoring of anti-abortion information and resources, but many of them are related to tech companies wanting to stay on good terms with local regulators and thus adjusting the results they provide to line up with local norms, even if those norms don't necessarily align with the majority, just whomever happens to be in charge. That said, the folks running Aid Access, one of the more prominent entities providing abortion pills and related services remotely, and which is based out of Austria, have said that the number of women requesting information about their services and requesting prescriptions for abortion pills have tripled in the wake of the aforementioned Supreme Court draft leak. They've also seen a nearly 3,000% increase in visits to their website, and that's under the current legal regime, wherein only 20 U.S. states allow the legal distribution of abortion pills via telehealth services. There's a good chance, then, that this practice will increase as laws clamp down on more overt abortion service providers and methods, leading to a thriving open online marketplace in some states, a thriving black market for the same in others and a legal system that, according to some state authorities at least, has no real way to either police or prevent it. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also support this and all of my projects all at once at understandery.com. But by becoming a monetary supporter via either mechanism, you are supporting these weekly free episodes and you also gain access to an additional monthly bonus episode. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. This is probably the, I don't know, fourth or fifth book I've read by Becky Chambers, and all of the books that I've read by this author have been just really lovely so far. Like those other works, this is a piece of science fiction that is non-standard in that it tends to deal primarily with the dynamics between different people, different entities. And those relationships themselves are just utterly fascinating. And the worlds that are built around these characters are often quite good as well. But it's those interpersonal dynamics that I find to be most rewarding and fascinating. And that tends to be what sets these books apart from so many other also quite good works of science fiction. And in this case, it's the relationship between a somewhat curmudgeonly distributor of tea, but who also serves the social role as a sort of monk slash psychiatrist for the people in their community, their relationship with a robot who is part of a species of semi-mythological robots that humanity created at a different point in our history. And that dynamic is fascinating. The world that they are operating in is fascinating. And this book is very much worth a read if you have a chance. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find a portfolio of my other projects, including my other podcasts, at understandery.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and such. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.